Howdy, friends! Uh, in this lecture, we're going to be uh, looking at the Upanishads and uh, reading the Upanishads. Um, uh, I want to say before I begin this lecture, first of all, that um, uh, that uh, occasionally in this lecture you may uh, hear me uh, use the word uh, Hindu, um, and I just want to acknowledge uh, that Hinduism doesn't really exist. Uh, you may have heard this from another source, but I want to reiterate it here. Um, uh, Hinduism is a is a term made up by Western academics as kind of an umbrella term for the the many thousands of sects uh, with you know, more or less related beliefs that we find in India. But in effect, um, the followers of these traditions actually call what they uh, what they follow, Sanatana Dharma. So I'm going to use Sanatana Dharma when I can, um, uh, but uh, every now and then I may slip and uh, and use the Western umbrella term Hinduism. I'm not trying to be offensive. Um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to try to 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 use the proper terminology where I can. So please bear with me and forgive me if I if I slip up. Um, when Sanatana Dharma began, um, it was really a nature religion like any other. Um, this very early version of the Dharma we uh, often call Vedism, um, and this and the and Vedism is the religion of the Aryan people who are indigenous to the Russian steppes. <clears throat> they are um, uh, they are a, uh, a people who breed horses and are very warlike and so, they rode down in a thundering horde and conquered the um, native peoples of Persia, and um, uh, which includes uh, Iraq and uh, and Afghanistan nowadays. Um, and then they um, rode in their thundering horde and conquered the people of northern India, um, and of course imposed their religion there, uh, their Vedic religion. So. When we look at their religion, we see that their gods are, like most native traditions, personifications of natural forces. So you have Indra, the god of thunder and the king of the gods. You've got Agni, the god of fire. You've got Vayu, the god of wind, and literally thousands of other nature deities that are attested to in the Vedic literature. Their scriptures were transmitted orally, originally. But eventually they were written down in Sanskrit, and they are known as the Vedas, or the Rig Veda. Um, nobody knows exactly when they were written, but it's a good guess that they go back 3,500 years or more. The Vedas, uh, the Rig Veda, is largely composed of hymns to Indra uh, and the uh, other early Vedic deities. And then revisions of the Vedas were compiled to arrange these hymns for liturgical use. Um, <clears throat> in one myth, we're told that the gods did not start off as gods at all, but in fact, they started off as demons who were opposed to the gods. So the gods and the demons um, decided to work together to churn the ocean into Amrita, into nectar, the magical elixir, elixir that granted unlimited life and power to anyone who drank it. And then, when the gods weren't looking, the demons stole the nectar and they drank it. And they then became the new gods and the old gods became the demons. So it's a fascinating myth, but what's really going on in this myth? It's about the displacement of the indigenous gods, the original gods in the story, with the Vedic gods who are the demons who drank the nectar and then became the gods. It's, what's fascinating is to see how neatly this myth preserves both the indigenous ambivalence toward the conquering deities and also reverence for them. <clears throat> it's kind of a myth that shows both sides of the story. Um, in Vedism, and even in later Sanatana Dharma, the terms gods and demons don't necessarily refer to the morality of the beings involved, but in fact, to their power. Those with the power are the gods, and those without the power became, by default, 
the demons or the enemies of the gods. So religious practice in this early stage was concerned with the generation of tapas, which is a Sanskrit word for heat. It also means spiritual power. So demons could become holy men, and, then, uh, and they could do this by means of sacrifice and asceticism, because they could gain enough tapas to, in fact, be a threat to the gods. Likewise, the gods need the sacrifices of human beings, but they, they don't want to be too holy. Uh, they don't want the human beings to be too holy, or the human beings' tapas would rival their, their own powers and, and, and therefore pose a threat to their supremacy. So the gods in Vedic Hinduism are really concerned with maintaining a balance of power. They want the sacrifices to keep the gods fed, but they also want to keep humans and demons in their place. And so holy enough to sacrifice, but not too holy uh, uh, to be rivals. So sacrifice is the primary means of worship in Vedic Hinduism, especially the fire sacrifice in which... Um, uh, in which uh, the Vedic people saw the entire universe in miniature. It was uh, everything in the universe is represented in the fire altar. And so the, it's through this sacrifice that the, that the natural cycles are kept in balance. It's, it's how the gods were honored and fed and kept happy. And it's the way that order was maintained in the universe and because there is order, there is safety and prosperity for the people. Now, as the priestly caste uh, in Vedism grew in influence and wealth, the sacrifices gradually became more and more elaborate and more difficult to perform, uh, not, uh, not to mention expensive. Um, and as the priestly caste became more powerful, they also became more corrupt. Uh, and started to use their priestly powers in service of those who, well, really could pay them the most, um, and thus leaving the common people, especially the poor, to fend for themselves, um, unless, of course, they could scrape an, enough change together to make it worth a Brahmin's time. Um, the Brahmins at this time um, brought little sense of spirituality to the common folk. It was mostly um, uh, what they brought was outward ritual, for the highest bidder, um, which is one of the reasons that there's such a deep emphasis on um, uh, ritual in the home, because uh, for so long, um, people had to do it for themselves, especially poor people. Now, one of the most elaborate and expensive of all the Brahmanic sacrifices was the horse sacrifice which was so grandiose that only kings could afford it. Um, at the height of the Vedic period, the horse sacrifice uh, often took weeks to perform and involved the killing of hundreds of horses, and it took um, 20 or more priests working around the clock to do it correctly. One slip, and they would have to start all over. Um, the last known uh, horse sacrifice was performed actually in 1986, and was filmed for the BBC in prosperity. Uh, for for posterity, um, I uh, actually uh, have seen this video. Um, and just to relieve your squeamishness and to my own great relief, um, gourds were sacrificed in place of the horses. Whew, right. Um, anyway, <clears throat> so it's about this time that a major shift occurred in Vedism. Nobody really knows how it happened, but someone, probably a Brahmin, discovered that the sacrifice could be performed internally rather than externally by the use of vivid imaginal practice. So a person could actually vividly imagine the sacrifice, you know, in, 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 in his head. And it would be just as efficacious as the physical ritual, but way cheaper because you're not killing any actual horses. Um, and so suddenly you had a bunch of priests sitting still going through this long 14-day ritual in their heads. 
what do you think is going to happen? One of them is going to veer off into the bliss of meditation and boom! They have an experience of unitive consciousness and they have no idea what just happened to them. So this happens to one of them and it happens to another, another of them. They're having these experiences of unitive consciousness as a result of their imagination experience and suddenly meditation is born. Well, these holy men, they realize we're really on to something here, but they don't know what because there's nothing in the Vedic religion to account for this experience. And, and it's not a popular discovery among the priestly caste for a number of reasons. First of all, anyone can do it. Anyone can sit down and um, go inward and have this experience of unitive consciousness, and it threatened the, the priestly monopoly on spiritual power in their culture. You have to be born a Brahmin, but you know, anyone can be a yogi. So this new spiritual experience threatened the Brahmin's religious monopoly. So not popular. Second of all, the experience of unitive consciousness had grave implications for Vedic theology because in fact it invalidated it. The mystery that they glimpsed in meditation went so far beyond the placation of nature spirits, spirits that the entire uh, that it threatened the entire edifice that, that the Vedic faith was built on. So that's a crisis. It's a theological crisis. It's a huge crisis for not only these priests, but for the entire culture. So even though the priests tried, they could not stem the tide of this new religious awareness because, you know, the cat was out of the bag. So people of other castes, began meditating, and they too had the same experience of unitive consciousness. And the religion of Vedism quickly transformed into a very different animal altogether. So this caused a huge crisis in Indian society. The spiritual experiences that people were having did not fit into the official theology enshrined in the Vedas or being taught by the Brahmins. In fact, there's nothing in the Vedic religion that even remotely explains or sheds light or supports the new experiences that people were having. A huge theological crisis. So, so what do you think happened? People started writing new scriptures that reinterpreted the old scriptures and traditions in light of the new experiences. And so Vedism went through what scholars today call the Upanishadic shift, named for the new scriptures that were appearing. Um, and these new scriptures uh, explained and documented this new awareness. So these are the Upanishads. Upanishad actually means sitting near, as in sitting at the feet of a guru or a holy person. But brilliantly, these new scriptures didn't simply displace the earlier Vedic strata, but simply placed the Vedic uh, hymns and Vedic myths in a larger, more cosmic context. It elevated Brahman to the place of the highest expression of the Godhead without invalidating the nature deities or the scriptures that came before it. I mean, yeah, they got a bit of a demotion, but they're still part of the system and they're still welcome at the party. <clears throat> but another crisis was brewing too that also played into the formation of the Upanishads. So what do you think that was? It was the corruption of the Brahmanical caste, the priests. In the Vedic class system, the Brahmins were at the top. So... Uh, you who are uh, studying to uh, be clergy, let this be a lesson to you. Never give clergy people any actual power because it'll go straight to their heads and will severely cripple their ability to actually serve people, especially the poor. And we've all seen what happens when you give clergy power. It's never pretty. And, you know, it, 
it, it's not, it's, this isn't something that's unique to the Vedic priests. I'm not picking on them. I mean, pick a religion, any religion, and look what happens to religious leader who's leaders that have too much power. You know, it's, it's not good. Um, and whenever it happens, it requires some kind of reformation movement. <clears throat> in Vedism, the corruption of the Brahmins resulted in three major reform movements. Uh, lots of minor ones as well, but, but three major ones. Um, there's, first of all, Buddhism, and we'll be talking about uh, Buddhism in our next lecture. Um, Jainism, um, which we won't be talking about, but very closely related to Buddhism in many ways. And um, the Upanishadic tradition of Sanatana Dharma. Um, and, and of course, there were, as I said, lots of smaller reform movements um, and, in fact, um, some later atheistic movements such, such as uh, Mimamsa and Samkhya and uh, Charvaka. Now, these are not unrelated crises. Both contributed to us having the Upanishads in our hands today. The crisis of the new religious experience brought about the ideas and the texts themselves, but it was the corruption of the Brahmins that caused it to catch fire and spread as quickly and thoroughly as it did. So <clears throat> let's take a closer look at the texts themselves. Take a look at the Brihad <clears throat> Aranyaka uh, Upanishad. Now, that's a mouthful, not a word I say every day. Now, in the first chapter, we see a description of what? The horse sacrifice. But it's not a horse sacrifice. What's really going on here? The horse sacrifice is beginning to be spiritualized. It's a metaphorical reading of the earlier scriptures. <clears throat> kind of like an allegorical reading that we talked about in my last lecture. The horse represents nature. The dawn gives it birth. Sunset is its death, its sacrifice, right? So <clears throat> this is a sacrifice that happens every day. Um, one of my former students summed this up perfectly um, in, um, in one of her papers. She said, while the Vedic tradition stresses the importance of external ritual, ceremony. The Upanishads were developed by teachers who viewed these outward forms as having lesser importance than the achievement of inner realizations. For example, those who may have doubted the relevance of the horse sacrifice, chapter one of the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad celebrated the cosmic significance of this sacrificial ceremony, demonstrating how it connected practitioners with heaven, the four seasons, the days and the nights and the stars and the rivers and the sea and voice itself. The Upanishad neatly sidesteps any concerns that the ritual killing of a horse may amount to an empty physical act by inciting the minds of the practitioners to use the sacrifice as a vehicle to experience the unity of all creation. That's one of those paragraphs that I wish I had written myself because it so perfectly sums up what this Upanishad is up to. <clears throat> now look at chapter four. What do we see here? We see Parusha, the primal self. Now in the Vedas, Parusha is the victim. It's the uh, it's the victim that the gods sacrifice, whose body becomes everything in the phenomenal universe. But in the Priyad Aranyaka Upanishad, Purusha is higher than the gods. The gods themselves are formed from Purusha's body. The Upanishad is very early, and this is one of the first instances where we see um, where we see a being who is prior to the gods or greater than the gods. Now, this theme gets developed in later Upanishads, especially in the person of Brahman. In the Kina Upanishad, <clears throat> and the Kina means from what or from whom, we see this wonderful myth where the Vedic gods come face to face with Brahman for the first time. <clears throat> who is this being who fills us with wonder, they ask themselves. 
This is from chapter 3 if you need to remind yourself. So, so what is this myth about? This, this myth where the, where the Vedic gods are asking themselves, who is this being that fills us with wonder? Well, the demotion of the Vedic gods from the enthronement of um, the, uh, from the, the, the demotion of the Vedic gods from their, their previous position at the top of the pile and the enthronement of Brahman in the new Upanishadic theology is really what's going on here. The Vedic gods are still there, but they've been brought down several notches. In the telling of this myth, you can watch that change in power actually happen before our very eyes. This is the social mobility of the gods that, that we get to see, right? Um, right here in, in the myth, right here in the text, in the Upanishad. It's absolutely fascinating. Now, there are lots of stories uh, in which this happens. I'll tell you another one. Um, Indra is the king of the gods, and he's building this gigantic palace so that it will you know, be a fit reflection of his glory. Um, and, uh, and every time he visited the royal carpenter to see how the work was progressing, he gets another idea about how to make it grander, larger, more worthy of his greatness. And finally, the carpenter is completely stressed out and realizes that if Indra keeps coming and making more and more and more demands, he is never going to be finished with this project. And so he goes to Brahma, the creator, and explains his problem. Now, Brahma is sitting on a lotus, which grows out of the navel of the sleeping Vishnu. Brahma tells the carpenter to go home. Something's going to be done to help him. So the next day, <clears throat> this beautiful <clears throat> blue boy surrounded by other children, appears at the gates of Indra's palace. <clears throat> Indra summons the boy to him and says, So why have you come to see me? And the boy says, I've heard that you're building this marvelous palace, more grand than any Indra before you has ever built. What do you mean, Indra's before me? I am the only Indra there is. And the boy laughs at him and says, Ah, oh, that's what you think. I have watched Indra's come and go, come and go. Vishnu sleeps in the ocean of the cosmos, and the lotus that grows from his navel is the universe. Brahma sits on the lotus, and when he opens his eyes, a world comes into being, and that world is ruled over by an Indra. And when he closes his eyes, the world disappears, and its Indra disappears with it. Each Brahma lives nearly 500,000 years, and then the lotus dries up and another grows in its place. How many Indras have there been? Well, how many drops of water do you think there are in the ocean? Just then, Indra notices an army of ants marching across his palace floor, and the boy points at the ants and says, See those? Those aren't ants at all. They're all the Indras. That have ever been. So needless to say, Indra, who thought he was the highest god in heaven and earth, was brought down a notch or two, as were the Brahmins, the professional clergy. In the later Upanishads, Brahman is the ultimate ground of all being, yet inside each and every being is a corresponding spirit, the Atman. The Atman is that bit of Brahman that lives in each of us. Brahman and Atman are the same. They are, they are one being, which means that you and the divine are one being. Thus it came to be seen that all of the Vedic gods were merely parts of Brahman, the one being who fills the universe, the being that fills us with wonder. Unfortunately, Brahman didn't seem to have much of a personality, apparently, because um, followers of the Sanatana Dharma quickly supplanted him with other gods that they liked better, like Shiva and Vishnu. But ultimately, in this tradition, it doesn't really matter what you call this one being. Brahma, Shiva, Vishnu, Kali, Durga, any name really will do, because even though there is only one being, that being can wear any face. One merely has to discover the mask of the divine to which one feels the most affinity and 
pray to that face. I have read that there are more um, gods in the Sanatana Dharma tradition than there are living followers of that tradition. And in this tradition, it doesn't really matter which god you appeal to because they are all the same god in the end. 